So to start, um, as you see, we have four panelists joining us, these Conrad, Hazam, Gonzali, Victor Romero, and James Daly. And I thought um, I could actually let each introduce themselves and some of, of their work with regard to and government infrastructure. So Steve, why don't we start with you? Sure, thanks, Joe. Uh, glad to be here. My name is Steve Conrad. I'm the Associate Director of Technology at the Digital Impact Alliance, which is part of the United Nations Foundation. And uh, Dial is uh, an organization that is uh, kind of, we call ourselves a think, do, replicate tank, uh, where we're trying to provide um, resources and models and be a convening organization to bring actors together uh and provide resources on how we can leverage technology to solve big problems and so uh in my role um i work to develop some technical resources uh that hopefully serve uh, donor organizations and ngos in discovering and leveraging digital tools to solve use cases and then uh, i'm also part of uh, an initiative called govstack uh, which we'll talk about a bit more uh in a few minutes but i'm glad to be here and uh, thanks for having me Great. So in order of our beautiful photos, Hazel. Thanks, Jill, for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kesom. Uh, I'm the founder of a co-founder of OpenG2P and OpenG2P was born in the early days of COVID-19 when we saw so many governments, so many organizations, especially in developing countries, struggling with getting cash in the hands of people who needed it the most. Um, um, uh, a group of volunteers, along with the government of Sierra Leone, along with MIFOS, along with DIAL, we started getting together and said, hey, what can we do? Uh, and it seems that uh, um, we you know, could really reflect also on the Ebola experience that uh, I was part of as a team leader for the payments program to help workers to design an end-to-end -end, um, government to people payments program that starts with enrollment to uh, uh, making the payments uh, you know so you can imagine the various kinds of government uh, ministries or departments uh, you know this this process needs to go through to really make it frictionless seamless interoperable uh, what what were the solutions in response to the significant challenges of COVID-19? So uh, OBG2P as a digital public goods was born then. It's still a work in progress. And one year on, really glad to be here speaking together on this. That's great. And we'll be, we'll be hearing more. Um, maybe dive into a little deeper into some of the we mentioned. Victor, uh, you have one title here as CEO, but um, most of us here also like you have other titles. <laughs> so please feel free to introduce yourself and, and your work and as a brother like you like um in the like the authority government infrastructure. And this is actually a great segue um from you kids on talking about um the upgrading the future level to the future. Hello, um, my name is Victor Romero. I am the CTO of Fintechem. We are uh, in Mexico. We have been working with the government in order to provide digital solutions in order also to, to uh, empower the, the people here in Mexico uh, in order to give um, a faster way to access to financial resources. And the last year, it was a challenge for everyone, every, uh, everywhere, because uh, people need somehow to, to continue with, the, with their lives, but they need the, the access to these financial resources. In Mexico, the government, the federal government, has uh, applied different uh, programs in order to, to solve or to try to, to have a, a better solution for this kind of um, uh, crisis that was caused by the COVID-19. One was the, the loan. So then we have used uh, open source software because also there is a change in the public politics about the use of the open source here in the federal government. And then uh, we have selected uh, as part of the solution the Apache 
FINERAC, which has been uh, used for the core banking solution. And we have implemented uh, different digital channels around it in order to make it easy, easier to, to access the financial resources. But we can speak all the challenges that are behind the, this adventure. Yes, definitely. I look forward to getting into some of those, those details on where the challenges lie. And then finally, uh, James, I don't even know if you need an introduction with this crowd, but <laughs> okay, great, great. I hope I can be heard. Um, so, right, I'm the chairman of the MIFOS initiative, uh, but the other hat that I have been wearing, um, so besides being on uh, involved in Venerac, which was contributed by MIFOS um, as part of a process of incubation to Apache a few years ago, four years ago. Um, uh, so I'm also on the, the Venerac uh, project. The um, the open G2P concept that really Kazum um, brought to the world, uh, I was very happy to uh, volunteer and spent the last, well, it's almost 18 months now um, working to make that a reality, so we want to we want to talk about that uh, today. And uh, I'm also very eager to eager to dig into um, the other topic, uh, another hat I wear, which is on the GovStack um, payments building block panel. So on that panel, um, we are working to establish the requirements for the payments building block that governments need to process G2P. P to G, so person to governments, um, and and flows, uh, you know, sort of between government uh, ministries and that type of thing. So, um, look forward to this panel. Great to get Kevin. Hey Jill, you're you're still pretty faint. I don't know if you can boost that. No. Hmm. We're not hearing you. It, it you're you're muted right now. It shows that you're muted on the controls. Um, Jill, why don't, why don't you refresh your browser? Um, in the meantime, if you could type in, okay, why don't we do this? Um, we'll start with, uh, Kazem. Kazem, perhaps you could speak a little bit about, uh, the role of G2P payments, um, more broadly and, uh, and talk about how this relates to sort of a global, um, set of activities. Sure, uh, James, that's a great question because until COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, I think many countries, many international development organizations, multilaterals, bilaterals, you know, go governments themselves, they didn't understand that the best way to help their people, especially people who have become newly poor, people who are struggling to uh, you know, have lost their jobs, are struggling to pay for food, um, that the best and the most effective and the fastest way to help them was to give, give, get hands in the uh, cash in the hands of people. I mean, that happened in, even, in the, even in the United States, uh, where the American government um, sent out money to uh, people who had just lost jobs. That happened in countries like India, where over 250 million women for example, where are given direct cash into their bank accounts. And that really kind of, um, and the success of that measure really was defined by whether countries had the digital public infrastructure in place to, uh, you know, identify the right beneficiaries, the right recipients, uh, whether they, their, their bank accounts were linked to their identity, 
whether the bank accounts were also linked to payment gateways, which could, you know, through a switch, just easily, um, you know, send the cash out, whether even the uh, cash out points or the digital usage points were easily available, whether on your mobile phones, whether in your neighborhood stores. And this really together defines the overall digital public infrastructure, whereby, uh, you know, billions of dollars of aid, whether in countries like Colombia, countries like Rwanda, Sierra Leone, I mean, this was the first and foremost measure to ensure that people could eat uh, by water if they needed to, uh, pay for health services. Uh, and therefore, it really underpinned the importance of building the digital public infrastructure, the backbone to make sure that, um, that you know, payments could get out to people who government had identified as, you know, the right beneficiaries uh, uh, to, to receive the, the support. Um. Right. Um, uh, when you when you speak about these things, um, uh, you, you know these things are simple at a certain level. But you know, why is it seeming like there's always a a never ending process of talking and not quite getting to solutions? You know, country after country uh, has struggled with this, and I'm, I'm wondering what you um n nobody you know so maybe speak to the india's ex the india's experience with the npci um and how that came about and, and maybe you know we can sort of draw some lessons from there and other parts of your work with the within the un sure um very happy to of course you know um i'm here in my capacity as as uh volunteer co-founder of Open GDP, but in my day job, I am uh, with the UN. Um, and we've seen that, you know, uh, countries like India that has uh, an identity system that's uh, called Aadhaar, uh, where identity is the law, uh, it's everyone's right, it is basically to, it's, you know, uh, not linked to citizenship, rather, it's just to verify you who you you are who you say you are, a very basic function, um, uh, you know, uh, and it has a, a, about 95% coverage across the country, which means that, you know, when government uh, wants to send, you know, money to 200 million women, it's linked to their digital identity, which basically means, you know, tremendous amount of savings, which otherwise would have gone in, in leakages to in, in the form of double payments, in the form of fraud accounts, uh, in the form of, you know, payments to people who are dead, <laughs> uh, etc. Um, and and I, I think the savings for the government of India runs in billions of dollars, really. Um, so that was, uh, you know, a, a um, one of the great uh, uh, components of the digital public infrastructure. The second is after you verify uh, a, a clean list of people that need to be paid, India also has this amazing infrastructure called the UPI, uh, uh, which is basically, you know, has over, I think, 100 plus participating uh, financial institutions, whereby through a switch, you just, you know, basically pay everybody. Uh, right into, the, into their accounts. You don't, uh, government doesn't need to create separate bilateral agreements or, uh, you know, with different financial service providers for each time that they have to pay their citizens. Um, and in many ways, there's also choices provided to citizens to say that, hey, I want my money in this account, not that account. Um, so really, you know, sort of once you have a backbone, really uh, the ability to improve uh, service delivery uh, you know, build more user choices. These are, uh, you know, uh, some ways in which um, uh, uh, governments who invest in digital public infrastructure and digital public goods uh, really benefit. Now, it's very complex to build one because it requires more than one government agency to participate. You know, you have the identity ministry, you have the financial services authority, you have ministries of finance, you have the social protection agency. And this is where, you know, really the um, 
challenge or the opportunity lies in terms of creating digital public infrastructure that are governed by enabling rules and regulations of the game uh, that protect users, that you know, build in the right kind of privacy safeguards, um, and requires coordination and collaboration across the government. So it's easier said than done. The devil, devil is in the details, and uh, it takes significant leadership at the country level uh, within governments, as well as significant capacity uh, to achieve it. Yep, yep. Hey, Jill, I think back to you as moderator. I hope you're online now. Oh, I'm still seeing your mouth move. <laughs> um, it's showing you unmuted. Um, well, I'll continue the questions maybe, um, Jill, if you want to. Yeah, there we go. Um, Right. I'm sorry. Uh, let's talk. So those are Jill's putting up the, the slide deck, deeper dive about core component, discovery of the building blocks. How do they integrate and come together? And then what's the key uh, barrier for digital public goods to scale and be adopted by the main providers of public goods, um, i.e. the governments? I think, Steve, given your role in establishing and, 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 and working on the gov stack and, and building blocks, do we... Uh, maybe speak to those challenges and questions. Sure, yeah, happy to do that. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, I think in our work uh, with Dial, we, uh, we were seeing that there are a lot of solutions and uh, products, open source tools and other platforms that were being developed to address needs um, around you know, healthcare or education or financial services. Um, but the challenge is, is Kazam, uh, alluded to is that, you know, many of these solutions were very sector specific, were designed to, to address very specific use cases and uh, were not able to integrate or interoperate with solutions and products that were being developed in other sectors. So, you know, the, the challenge, as Kazan said, you know, the, the education ministry was not necessarily talking to uh, the Ministry of Health in a country and ensuring that the platforms and solutions that were being developed were interoperable. So uh, back in 2019, Dial partnered with uh, the International Telecommunic Telecommunications Union, a part of the United Nations, and developed this framework oriented around building blocks. We realized that solutions are often made up of common components. You know, you need an identification component. You need a way to register people into a program or system. You need a way to send messages to uh, to clients or, or participants in a program. And so uh, we developed this theoretical model oriented around common building block components that could work together, that could be inter interoperable and work together to be stitched together into cohesive solutions uh, that would be cross-sectoral, that would work seamlessly together. If we have a common identity layer, then um, that can be used in an education system, in the health system, in a payment system. And so <clears throat> starting with this theoretical construct, then uh, Dial and ITU in partnership with uh, the German government and the government of Estonia, who has really become a model in many ways of e-governance and interoperable government services, uh, we formed this coalition called GovStack to take this theoretical idea and try and make it tangible and real. So the work then becomes, how do we define specific core common specifications and standards for these building blocks, whether it's payments or messaging or identification, uh, so that we're all speaking the same language, we're all on the same page, and we're all working together. So the work of GovStack has been to convene groups of experts in different fields, like James in the field of payments, and we have identity experts and um, registration and messaging and, and uh, interoperability experts working together to define common standards that we can agree to and then leverage to build cohesive and interoperable solutions. So still very much a work in progress. And as Kaysom said, uh, the devil is in the details, but uh, we're working together to try to make that a reality so that, um, so that we uh, end up with infrastructure and platforms that don't require uh, 
reinvention for every different use case or every different project. And so that's the hope. Uh, and part of the reason we're so excited about OpenG2P because from the beginning, uh, it's been structured and oriented uh, to align with, with some of those building block principles and fundamentals. So uh, hope that provides a little bit of context. It does. Am I audible now? <laughs> I, I see James clapping, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, to uh, James for stepping in there as as moderator. Um, and I I don't think I've ever believed in PowerPoint as much as I have today in this session where I was I was silenced. Um, so I um, I appreciate how. Um, Kezam, you gave this example of India and how India had, has essentially a stack um, of systems that can integrate. And Steve, how, how you also introduced the building blocks in terms of the role they play um, in this in this larger system. Um, but what I think would be great to hear a bit more about next was how can these building blocks really integrate um, and come together and also serve a purpose for this larger reference architecture so that different kinds of open source tools and systems can, can um, be scaled in terms of the way they'll be able to find more homes, if we will. Um, James, would you be willing to speak to that? Well, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, I think, uh, you know, one of the interesting um, problems in funding the commons, right? Which is something that the Apache Foundation has worked to solve. Um, what we're trying to solve in the digital public goods space, um, it's the same kind of problem. How do you, how do you link um, funding mechanisms to projects that build the, fundament, the fundamental building blocks? And I think with Open G2P, what we're trying to do is say, look, there is a set of functionality that is needed by all governments. Why don't you join in and help us build this? Why don't you contribute your, your resources, just a, a, a small fraction of what you spend today on trying to get payments to people? I mean, I've seen some estimates that it costs you know, anywhere between $5 and $25 to, to send money to people. Um, and so these are very high costs that governments mm -hmm. face. And so at an economics level, at a, at a functional function of government level, this seems like something that they should be interested in doing. Um, I think with the building blocks approach, uh, with the GovStack approach, there's also this other thing, which is maybe a little wonky, but it's procurement. For years, one of the things that, that MIFOS is, and has faced and which FINERAC has faced is, you know, large government procurement projects where you approach the government and you say, well, we have an open source solution which allows you and your teams and your universities to help spin up something. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, the, the vendor is this small little company in your country. And the government procurement processes don't really lend themselves to promoting that kind of all of economy uh, approach. Instead, mm -hmm. they go out and they find the vendor that has always done the same thing and always, you know, charged them lots of money, but done so in a predictable, uh, auditable way. And I think Victor might be able to speak to, you know, some of the reasons why the Mexican government has chosen to go in an open source direction. It's partly because of this challenge, right? Because mm -hmm. you have vendors who want to charge the government and they respond to the RFPs, the procurement processes, and they get selected. So there's a challenge in the open source world of how do you make something sustainable? There's a challenge for governments in how do you uh, procure things that are going to be better for you in the long term, but it's it's not part of your normal way of doing business. So I think with GovStack, mm -hmm. one of mm -hmm. my hopes is that um, the procurement process can be built around the requirements. And then one of the requirements will be for openness, transparent, uh, open source components, um, and everything you know available for people to 
to view and, and inspect. I hope I answered your question. I may have gone off on a tangent. No, the, the intention was more to solicit um, your your thinking and your knowledge on this topic um, than to test you. <laughs> so I, I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, I wanted to ask, so I, I think one thing that um, Steve might have alluded to was about some of the fragmentation that the industry has experienced um, with um, solutions being developed. They tend to be very sector specific. Uh, Steve, yes, I think you've mentioned that right. Um, James, would you say that the procurement, the way procurement's done at gov level is also quite fragmented? Yeah, I mean, so you'll have the Ministry of Agriculture that procures something. You'll have the, you know, the social protection uh, ministry. You'll have the UN agency that's operating in country. You'll have a World Bank project around ACH and payments infrastructure. You'll have various foundation funded um, things, perhaps with backing from DFID, that's the UK aid group, or from USAID, the UN, American government project. And then you, I mean, so the list goes on and on. It gets very fragmented very quickly. And even getting everybody in the same room is hard because you don't even know necessarily who all is trying to work on these things. Um, and so I think one of the ways you overcome that is through transparency, through open, through open protocols and open architectures. And then people can say, well, I identify with that part of the architecture, or I'm working on this vertical using that architecture. Without that kind of, you know, approach, people do all sorts of, you know, useful projects, but ultimately don't get to a, a better vision. Um, and, and I think India, I mean, Kazem maybe you could speak to this. Uh, India really solved that by not with a grand cathedral, but with a couple of people with a very clear idea of building the fundamentals into the system. And then things got built around that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great way to describe, um, I think, uh, India's approach. I, I heard someone speak recently about um, the NPCI, that National Payments uh, Corporation of India and how, and this gentleman said, you know, no one sat down and said, this is our vision that we have exactly how it will work in 10 years from now. Um, but it was much more as uh, you said, fundamentals based uh, and principles based on what an overall system would need to be sustainable and be able to evolve in the future. Um, but um, I, I want to leverage what, what you just uh, shared about these government procurement processes and move over to Victor to hear about um, uh, your experience uh, working in Mexico with, with an actual product and, and then working directly with government. Oh, sorry. Yeah, as uh, yes, as James has mentioned, the um, procurement of the government is very fragmented here. Uh, because they are looking for the same solution. For example, how to identify the, the people. There are uh, already building blocks that can be shared or can be a common framework for all the institutions, can be reused, uh, and the people can, uh, I mean, the, the people in charge of this, of implementing this solution and also use the solution, will be more used to, to have a common repository, a common reference about where to find these, these solutions. And then moving to the procurement also is, is a challenge because the regulation about how the government uh, do the or select the vendors is, uh, I think, is over-regulated uh, because they, they need for one, in one, in one hand, to provide transparency uh, about the, the process. On the other hand, is to, to have the quality of the service and the products. So then th this must be, um, I think, uh, simplified in order to, to allow uh, this existing solution to enter in a, I think, in, in a legacy world of existing solution of, of the vendors that they are used to have this kind of, of 
database, this kind of interface or operating system. So that if we can uh, promote this uh, easier way to, to to allow the entrance of this uh, software, we can accomplish the same uh, task, that can facilitate the access to the people to be um, uh, at least in our case, to, to be included in one sector, for example, financial. Uh, this will help a lot uh, to, to, to to use these building blocks that we are talking about, and not only in financial, because this is our expertise, but in other ways, for example, the content management in order to inform the, the population, uh, for example, having a, a registry about the vaccination uh, dates uh, to program this vaccination. This, this will help a, a lot to all the, the governments and the population because uh, at the end, the, the government is serving the, the population. Mm -hmm. That's a great example that you brought in of an additional use case. Um, of uh, you, in addition to payments um, or a GDP payments, kind of a use case that we've been talking about, also um, a use case for vaccination certificate, uh, you know, or birth registration. Um, I think that helps drive home the um, level of complexity and the breadth that uh, governments will be looking, the breadth of services that governments would be looking to procure and, and where their needs would be. Um, I think that uh, maybe just one, a few more words on this topic um, around pro procurement, because this is so essential to um, getting some of these solutions to scale. Um, I wanted to uh, turn to Kesem and ask about some of um, your experience in this domain um, with with UN and if there are also are any country examples you might be able to to share with us and if you don't have good examples we'd love to hear about your examples of the the challenges that you've run into <laughs> I think um, James has very right rightly highlighted so many of the challenges which really stem from you know uh, ways in which governments have interfaced with software uh, and how that uh, that you know need, uh, needs to change and it's really a mindset shift uh, at so many levels that that needs to happen um, secondly you know uh, about the India example that we were talking about uh, there was someone who said you know are we uh, are we building to scale or should the question be what can scale? Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, because digital public goods is, is trending now, there are lots of people building like mouse, you know, millions of little mouse, as opposed to like building an elephant or, you know, imagining an elephant and then, you know, kind of building out, you know, through the digital building blocks but recognizing that the foundational infrastructure for digital building blocks is going to be you know your identity system your payment system your data exchange systems and then around that is a service architecture of you know health delivery of gdp delivery of um, of so many other you know uh, potential things like access to credit uh, that that is possible um yeah so so i think I think many governments are demonstrating significant leadership and and we see that this is you know uh going to move forward but it does you know take significant uh commitment uh you know it the building building these systems and you know key pieces is going to take more than one election cycle <laughs> one you know uh it, it takes you know india for example started even before the current uh, honorable prime minister was at seat you know so so in in that sense this really is an apolitical agenda mm -hmm. and must mm -hmm. so yes i heard someone say recently that it took 10 years right 
Uh, and if we think about that in um, just the context of, of the elections, you realize how short elections are. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe just for a few minutes and the nature of being in the name of being interactive, um, I put together this um, rather hideous diagram, let's say. Um, but I'm, what I'd like is to invite you as esteemed panelists to, to comment on, on this. And so what we have here is on one side, we have open source software for public services and for government system. And on the other side, we have how governments procure systems. And I think some of what um, we've heard today and some of what I've thought about in advance are, you know, kind of at the middle of this are defining requirements agreeing on recognized standards and also commitment to quality, these enterprise grade solutions. But there seems to be a gap in this happening at the pace at which there's this push and this desire for, for digital public goods. Um, and so I thought I, I would invite you as panelists to one, critique this, you know, add to it, cut things off, and maybe also can we define maybe a bit more clearly or brainstorm how to put these together? You know, what are ways, and given this is ApacheCon, what are ways we could, um, you know, leverage the Apache community um, or other, you know, the, the Apache way to help achieve this? Well, I'm, I'm really interested to hear Victor's on the ground reality of, trying to react to procurements um, and getting things um, accepted, acceptable by government. Um, I, I think that's where the rubber hits the road. My, my big audacious idea, like if I were to wave a wand, it would be to say to governments, let's create a fund, a hundred million dollars, which is trivial for governments to put together such a fund and fund a set of open source projects developer by developer. So these could be funds that go to the Apache Foundation, to Linux Foundation, to, to other sort of known established projects that could then give, you know, fellowships or scholarships or bug, uh, you know, find bug finding fees or, or, you know, whatever those structures would be to really encourage a faster development cycle. I think one of the problems is that the you know, when you look at open source versus commercial space, the software development cycle um, for the commercial space is develop a feature, come out of, uh, you know, get, get paid, get paid to do it, develop another feature, get paid to do I mean, it's a, it's a cycle that builds on itself. And in the open source space, it, you, hopefully you get to the better features, the more meritocratous features, but you are relying on people contributing in and, um, and I think the Apache Foundation has figured out a way to do that in a, in a good way with a bunch of big, you know, big projects. But for governments, they don't necessarily have the wherewithal to sort of engage in that. So I think the funding mechanism would be one one big thing that I would that I would like to see. But I would love to hear from Victor as well. A couple of thoughts uh, based on what James was saying. I very much agree. I mean, uh, as I've spent a lot of time talking to procurement uh, professionals uh, within nonprofits, UN organizations, and country ministries. And the, the challenge is that most of them are not, are not technically savvy. And so how are we um, empowering them? So largely a lot of the decisions, technical decisions, are left to the, the local implementers or whoever gets the contracts. But we can provide support in you know work like GovStack or these agreed upon standards that now when we're writing our procurement or calls, you know, we can insist that whoever's implementing is adhering to these standards and is in line with an interoperable building blocks style approach. Um, I think to James' big idea, I, I, I love it. I know that that's one of the goals for the GovStack initiative is once we get through the spec work, we want to actually start implementing and have a pool of funding available and a procurement process that is open and transparent and allows yeah, uh, developers of these open source platforms to contribute and, and be compensated for contributions that move the ecosystem towards uh, infrastructure and platforms that, that are 
interoperable that align with the building blocks uh, concept. And, you know, it'll take time, but, you know, I think as we provide some models and the right incentives, uh, we can we can start to move the needle a bit. Mm -hmm. Victor, you, you have two, two requests, dying to hear your thoughts. <laughs> okay, let me, let me share our ground experience. Um, I think the, this is a change of mindset, not, not only at technology level, but this is something that needs to meet the, the needs and the expectation of the population. Talking from, um, from the need that uh, is requested to the governments, for example, transparency. Transparency is in order to avoid the, the corruption. If the governments have a, a standard way to do the procurement of the software, the selection of the vendor, and also if they have a legal framework, for example, here in Mexico, we have the austerity law, uh, the government can select open source software instead of a closed software or proprietary software if the software has the same functionality and the gaps, if there is a gap and all the software have, have, have gaps because the business needs or the social needs uh, require to be adapted for the local um, um, regulations or for the local needs because every country has the, the difference and this way the, the, the government can acquire the, the services of, of, of the open source having this this legal framework because the government also needs to needs to be or to have this kind of, of, of framework for doing the, the procurement and selection of the, of the vendors on the other way is the culture. I mean, the, the culture of contributing back to the open source software, because it, we think that it, it cannot be marked as national secu security for keeping the, the software or the software that was uh, enhanced for, for the government as close as we, we need to contribute back. And this must be clarified at the beginning of the of the project, and also it is important to, to, to uh, I, I think, socialize or, or to have this kind of discussion before the, the project in order to, uh, that all the stakeholders can understand what is open source. It doesn't mean free, as, as gratis, as, okay. but this, this has a, a cost of implementing, of contribute back, sharing experience also, because the, the knowledge must be shared out. In, in this way, we can uh, promote to the governments this kind of, of software. We can exchange the experience, not only in Mexico, uh, the, the community itself can use the, this success case to everyone in, in everywhere. So then uh, it is not, 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 not it's not easy, of course, it, it, it has years of uh, working uh, uh, about talking with the, the, the persons, not only uh, ministers, but also with uh, uh, education. I mean, education is how, how you get this, this work done, not only by people uh, around the world, but locally, because the government will prefer the local uh, work. But uh, we, we need to, to exchange the experience with people around the world. So then uh, it, it is a, a challenge to, to have in the schools, in the univer in universities, this culture of open source software. Um, I, when I was younger, I used to spend hours and, and times in the universities uh, talking about open source software, convincing people why, why we need to use some kind of operating system. Now, for example, uh, Finerac uh, is a framework more, more complex trying to solve a, a vertical, which is financial, but it, it, it uses and it implements a lot of uh, open source software. And I'm talking about this culture that, was being, that has been promoted, created around the, the use of open source software. We can create the, the public policies, the laws, and, mm -hmm. and the, the people 
and the governments can have a reference about how to use or how to acquire the services uh, mm -hmm. using uh, open source software. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. Thank you so much for um, also moving into that uh, topic of that deeper dive into governments contributing back and, um, you know, talking about the, the mindset and this openness and sharing. And I think we've actually uh, touched on all of these these question marks, mindset, model, funding. Uh, and it sounds like they're all these components are, are important. Um, I have have been alerted that we really need to wrap. Um, so I, I think maybe we can leave some of uh, our additional questions that that we have outstanding for next year's apache con and we can see see where we are there um i want to thank everyone so much for joining and for uh, also being persistent and sticking with uh, even during uh, these audio difficulties um three three times a charm worked on the third headphone so thank you everyone so much thanks jill thanks thanks Rassi. thank you thanks all thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Kazon. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Victor. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Kazon. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jane. See you.